the central region with our chosen. Virgilio Almario is an artist, poet, editor, critic, translator, teacher, and cultural manager. He was known by his pen name, Rio Alma, which is from his surname, Almario. And in the years of martial law, he set aside the modernism and formalism. And he focused more on nationalism, politics, and activist movement. And for his notable works, we have Palipad Hangin, Katon para sa Libang Pandama, Sentimental, Dust Devils, Tatlong Pasyon sa Ating Panahon, Buwan Buwang Bulawan, UP Dictionaryong Pilipino, Kulo at Kolorum, Baklang Kolorum. For his achievements and awards, it will be discussed by Ms. Punong Bayan and literary analysis to be tackled by Mr. Uh, Ms. Achiko and Ms. Castellano. For his achievements and awards, he was elected as a chairman of National Commission for Culture of and the Arts on January 5, 2017. Almario has been honored with many awards, including the National Artist for Literature on June 2003. He has also received the Centennial Award for Literature by the Cultural Center of the Philippines in 1998, the Southeast Asia Wright Award in Bangkok in 1989. Palanca Memorial Awards for Poetry and Essay in 1970, 1979, 1984, and 1990. And the CCP Literary Award for Poetry and Essay in 1975, 1979, and 1984. Almario was also named one of the 10 Outstanding Young Men, OTOYM, in 1980. Four organizations. He was a founding member of the Galian Sa Arte at Tula or GAT along with fellow poets Teo Antonio and Mikey Bergonia. He was the founder and workshop director of the Linangan Sa Imahen Retorica at Anyo or Lira award-winning writers and poets such as Roberto and Rebecca Anuevo, Rom Romelo Bakiran Jr., Michael Corosa, Jerry Gracio and Bim Nadera are some of the products of the Lira workshop. Here are some other information about him. He was an instructor at the Ateneo de Manila University from 1969 to 1972. He used to promote Filipino languages and spread the second most Philippine modernism movement with the Filipino poetry with the Bangahas and Antonio. He was five years old when he wrote and recited his first original poem. His teacher then had to pass a letter of recommendation to the Department of Education in the Bulacan capital for him to qualify to study a much younger age. He tapped his class and he was tasked to deliver a piece for his first grade graduation ceremony at the Camias Elementary School in Bulacan. That's something he did. With Greece is as he was already able to read and recite verses at this young age. He has written more than a hundred poems and stories, as well as numerous essays on literature and history published in national and international publications. As executive director and editor of Adarna Books, he has spearheaded the publication of 50 children's storybooks in the Aklat Adarna series. He is much respected poet, literary critic, and writer of stories for children. He is acknowledged by peers and contemporaries as a purveyor of new ideas and a navigator for new directions in Tagalog poetry and literary scholarship. Also, Rio Alma exemplifies the artist who has gone beyond the perfection of his craft, aware of his own responsibility and role in Philippine culture. He has become a moving force, according to Alfred Newsom. Despite his many honors and achievements, he remains 
close to his Bulacanio roots, often visiting his home in Camias, San Miguel. He states in an interview that he is proud to be a Bulacanio. Almost all of his books have a bit of Bulacan, the province of his childhood, in it. Panga Retrato at Recuerdo, a coffee table book published in 1986 that contains poetry and photos about traditions like fiestas and cockfighting in his hometown. And there was a photographer who also had roots in San Miguel who helped him with the book. They worked together for about three months, going to Bulacan every weekend to take photos. That's all pop for Virgilio Almario. Good morning, I am Abigail A. Castellano. And I am Maika Chico. And we are going to present to you our chosen piece, Ang Wika Ko by Virgilio Almar. Ang Wika Ko ni Rio Alma. Ang Wika Ko ay wikang atin, katutubo, na minanapan ni ina sa nuno ng kanyang nuno. Taglay nito ang sanaysay na taal at mula puso at ang ugat ng lumipas na tagbagyo ng tumubo. Hindi ito natatakot sa pagsako. Yumayaman nito kahit lumuluhang nakagapos. Ngunit kapag nakalaya, asahan mong magsasabog ng bulaklak at insenso sa anak ng paghahamok. Ang wika nga, Walang wikang isinilang upang maging mas mataas kaysa ibang salitaan. Abahin tayo. Walang wikang sa sarili yumayaman ng higit pa sa may arit gumagang araw-araw. Umibig man at manalig sa banyaga, ngunit huwag lilimutin ang sarilit inang wika. Malanguna sa mabangot bulaklaking dayong lila, ngunit huwag isasangla at hindiwa mo malaya. Ang wika ko'y wika nating malikhain. May hiwaga ng gunitang paghinukay, lumalalim. Lang hapin mo't ang linamnam, umaalab kong haplusin, kabaak mo, buong buo, iyong iyo, pag inangkin. And now, we'll discuss the literary analysis of Pio Alma's poem entitled, Ang Wika Ko. Let us discuss first the structure of the poem. The syllabic structure of Ang Wika Ko is in a 12-16-16-16 syllabic structure. If we are to count the syllables for each stanza, the number of syllables in the first line is 12 and 16 for the rest of the lines. So, rhyming scheme, we were actually a bit confused regarding its rhyming pattern because when we analyzed it, the rhyming scheme actually differs for each stanza. So, the rhyming pattern on the first line, as well as on the fourth line, is obviously in an A-A-A-A rhyming pattern in which all of the lines rhyme. This type of rhyming scheme is also known as monorhyme, which comes from the word mono, which means one, indicating that it has only one rhyming pattern. Well, the second and third stanzas are free verse because it does not have a consistent rhyming scheme or fixed metrical pattern. And the final stanza has an ABAA rhyme pattern since all of the first, second, and third lines rhyme. This type of rhyming scheme is most commonly found in a villanelle which has five three-line stanzas in an ABA pattern and ends on a quatrain with an ABAA rhyming scheme. The poem Ang Wika Ko primarily tackles about Filipinos taking responsibility for their own language and cultures and how we as Filipinos should take this obligation seriously. The 
The poem also showed some kinds of figurative language. One of them is the personification, wherein in the poem, human characteristics like isimilang, hindi natatakot, nakagapos, and lumuluha are applied to the poem to explain a non-human feature of the main subject in poetry, which is the language. The poem also represents its figurative language as hyperbole, as it uses exaggerated words and statements like isasangla pati diwa mong malaya in order to convey the deep meaning of each part of the poem. Aside from the, big, aside from the previous figurative language mentioned, we may also observe some metaphors in the poem. The line, kabaak mo, buong buo, iyong iyo pag inangkin is an example. The Filipino language is being equated with the word kabaak, with the idea that, just like the word kabaak, it is a component or a part of something that may represent how the Filipino language is a part of every Filipino's identity and how we should embrace it with the line, iyong iyo pag inangkin. This pair of words is used in place of another to elicit a meaning and imply a similarity between them. So there are many symbolisms that can be found throughout the poem. Some phrases or words may embody an idea that is not explicitly stated. Some examples would be the word wika. The word wika in the poem may be represented as a kayamanang hindi mawawala. Wika symbolizes how Filipinos are so vigorous in fighting for their inang wika for they believe that it's their culture and that our native language is the pamana from our ancestors, an inheritance that cannot be stolen. And tagbayon ng tumubo may symbolize as the panahon kung saan ang ating wika ay ibinababa sa masalimuot na panahon ng pananakop and lumuluhang nakagapos as di wikang pinipilit na ibinababa at pinapaltan ng bagong salita. Both phrases tackle how Filipinos strive to bring up and keep our native language in existence despite our complicated colonial history. Diwang Malaya may be represented as the pag-aalaga sa sarilit inang wika. It symbolizes how we, Filipinos, should nurture and protect our language. For us to be able to have a Diwang Malaya, taking our responsibility in nurturing it should be taken seriously and should be done by everyone. And lastly, sa Laysay na Taal, that symbolizes the makaluma at nakaraang pinanggalingan ng ating wika. It symbolizes that our language is not composed for nothing. It has its own purpose. Our language is a prominent type of literature created by our ancestors from the start when we had no equipment to communicate and has been inherited by every generation. And now, let us move to the moral lesson of the poetry. The moral that the poem wants to convey is that Filipinos should value and enrich themselves by embracing the Filipino language, which our ancestors passed down to us. Despite being colonized, we must constantly practice, use, and be proud of our language in order to preserve our culture. Despite being surrounded by diverse cultures and languages, we must not lose sight of the significance of our language and culture in our society. Our language is a crucial part of our identity as Filipinos, and we should be the ones to promote and deepen our understanding of it. And those are the texts and authors from the Philippine regions, a presentation by Group 3 of 12 ABM. Good morning. The next author that will be presented is an author from Region 6. She is Magdalena Halandoni. Her full name is Magdalena Gonzaga Halandoni. She was a fictionist and a poet before. Her birthplace is Iloilo City, Philippines. She was born on May 27, 1891, and she died on September 14, 1978. 
at the age of 87. Now let's proceed with Magdalena's career. Originally from Haro, Iloilo City, Magdalena Halandoni was a Filipino feminist writer. She began writing at a young age wherein she already had her poems published at the age of 12. She published her first novel, Ang Mga Tunok Sang Isa Kabulak, or The Thorns of a Flower, which was later followed by many novels, compilations of poems, and short stories. Halandoni only wrote for publication purposes due to the male-dominated society at the time. Back then, female voices in literature were not taken seriously by the general public. Although her mother strictly forbade her to take literature seriously, she refused to do so and devoted her life entirely to literature. If we will notice, the subject of her works mainly focuses on the history of Panay and Ilongo culture. With her writing skills, she is one of the powerful voices of the, of the people back then who seeks to achieve women's suffrage and other political issues. Her famous poem, Ang Gitara, is read in classrooms all over the country today. Throughout her turbulent and displaced life, she still managed to publish 36 novels, 122 short stories, 7 novelettes, 7 long plays, 24 short plays, and, dial di and Dialogos in verse compiled in two volumes, seven volumes of personally compiled essays including some translations from Spanish and two autobiographies. Some of her works are Ang Mga Tunok Sang Isa Kabulak, Ang Matam Kong Pagkabata, Ang Gitara, Sakapaang Sang Inaway, Ang Kahapon ng Panay, Ang Dalaga sa Tindahan. Pagdalena Halandoni's notable awards, she received the Republic Cultural Heritage Award in 1977. That was a year ago before she died. I will be forced to write when I feel that my nose is being assaulted by the scent of flowers, when my sight is filled with promises of the sun, and when my soul is lifted by winged dreams to the blue heavens. Just a trivia. Magdalena mentioned this line in her childhood autobiography, Ang Matam Kong Pagkabata, or My Childhood, or My Sweet Childhood. As we can see, her words are deep and she really de she's really devoted in her literature. Up next will be the literary analysis on one of Magdalena's poems to be presented by Miss Tan. Good morning po, ma'am. Rinig po ba ako? Yes po. Sige po, sandali lang po. May, pro may problema lang po sa connection. Thank you po.
Ang ermita sa barrio, and also known as the chapel in the barrio, has has two translations, the Ilonggo version and the English version. I'm going to read the English version. Humble and serene beyond compare, its door facing the sea, Nipa and Kogon touched and bamboo frame, painted by the mellow of dawn. Standing there by the mountainside, its door wi wide open, spacious and peaceful, and hitched on a branch of dap dap tree. Loosely are its rusty bells. Inside the sacred image of Christ, whose sorrowful face induces a man to weep. There on his ancient altar, he invites the visitation of adoring birds. The next part will be presented by Maria Isabel Tan. The rhyming scheme and syllabic structure will be presented by Maria Isabel Tan. But it seems that she has a problem with her connection. The, the first stanza in the poem, Ang Ermita sa Barrio, is in, the, is, in, is in monorhyme, while the second and the third stanza is alternate rhyming scheme. The poem also has 12 syllables per rhyme. Monorhyme means that in the, in the poem, There, there is only one, one rhyme scheme. And, and the alternate rhyming scheme is like A, B, A, B, A, some, something like that, A, B, A, B. Theme. The, the poem is about a wide and peaceful chapel in the barrio. The chapel has an altar of Christ. The chapel is made of nipa, kogon, and bamboo, and it is surrounded with trees and birds which are flying inside of it. Just like in the past poem, this poem also has personification. Painted by the mellow of dawn, standing there by the mountainside, there on his ancient altar he invites the visitation of adoring birds. Another example is hyperbole, which is humble and serene beyond compare, whose sorrowful face induces man to weep. Symbolism. The chapel, described as nipa and kogon touched in bamboo frame, indicates the simplicity of the natural aesthetic represented in the poem. This also indicates that the, the chapel, the poem was set in a province, in a simple place where nature and man coexists. The chapel also symbolizes how a community of people with the same beliefs can be united without the use of elegant structures, that a simple nipa hut is enough to form a bond within people, enough to form a community with loving and helping people, that as long as there is a community, Simplicity can be enough. There on his ancient altar, he invites the visitation of adoring birds. This line simply symbolizes the sense of identity in a community and the warm, fuzzy feeling of peace and love of a sense of community, supporting each other and providing for each other's needs. Good day everyone, especially to Ms. Abed Lorraine Hernandez, our subject teacher in 21st century literature from the Philippines and the world. I am pleased that you could attend today's presentation. I'm very excited to discuss our group project for the 21st century literature from the Philippines with you. To proceed, let us describe Region 7. Region 7, also known as the Central Visayas, is the Philippines' second smallest area with a landmass of 14,923 square kilometers. This area accounts for about 5% of the country's total land area in between major islands of Luzon and Mindanao. 
The Central Visayas, or also known as Region 7, is in the center of the Philippine archipelago. This, the Visayan Sea borders in the north and the Camote Sea on the east, the Mindanao Sea on the south, and the province of Negros Occidental on the west. Political boundaries serve as the basis for regional borders. Central Visayas is one of the country's eight center tourist destination, as well as one of the Visayas supra regions with a tourism based industry. And now, let us have Ms. Giselle Fajardo and Ms. Lovely J. Barnizo to elaborate Erlinda Alburo's career biography, as well as her literary works and their analysis for this region. A pleasant morning, everyone. Maayong buntag sa tanan. Aniya ako din hi aron ipresentar ang career biography ni Erlinda Quintana Alburo. Gikan sa Region 7. Or in English, I am here to present the career biography of Erlinda Quintana Alburo from, Re from Region 7. Throughout the 21st century, the views of life with the help of the local authors and the existing literature helps people to demonstrate a strong knowledge and universal understanding in the progressing society. One of its members is Erlinda Quintana Alburo. Sustaining in divorce like this is very vital in the age of our globalization. People need to look at how local experiences local languages, and craft literary gems to prevent fading away the great essence of the local literature. Moreover, Irlinda Quintanar Alburo is a local Cebuana poetry writer who grew up in Argao, Cebu City, an award-winning author who wrote the Patay na Tuod si Maria Clara. Irlinda Quintanar was born in the year 1946 and grew up from the prominent family of Argao, Cebu City, Philippines. Her parents are Virgilio Quintanar and Isidora Ferrer. In addition, her hometown had been quite influential in the development of her personal love in line with literary works. In fact, some of her books are inspired from the Cebuana traditions and literature. Erlinda K. Alburo has completed her PhD from Silomani University in the field of literature. She is also the director of Cebuana Cebu Center, which is in included in University of San Carlos. She teaches literature, English, and research. Indeed, Erlinda has been involved in many works and contributed towards the betterment of the society. The Faigao Memorial Writers Workshop of Cebu, which takes place once in a year, is arranged by Alburo. Lastly, Alboro plays an active role in the Women in Literary Works, or WILA. And now we have lovely Bernice here to present the notable works, achievements, and awards. Good day, everyone. I'm lovely J. Bernizo, and her notable works are First is the 58 Unsa by Molukso, in English, at 58, What Else May Live? Second, Pahiyum sa Katao, in English, Mermaid Smile. Third, Sa Pagtungtong na Hog Cinquenta, in English, Upon Reaching the Age of Fifty. And lastly, Sugilanong Sugbawanon, Cebuano Fiction. Her achievements are Former Director of the Cebuano Studies Center of the University of San Carlos, Philippines. Second, Active Member of Women in Literature. Literary Arts, or WILA. She teaches on the Anthropology of Linguistics. Third, published 54 works in 90 publications in five languages and 419 library holdings. And last, her 21st century poem, Patay na Tood si Maria Clara, is the best-selling literary work of Erlinda. And her awards... Top 15 Literary Writers in Cebuana Post World War II Era. In 2008, she received the Outstanding Arguanon in the 400th Anniversary of Argao Cebu. In 2010, won the Gawad Pazma Cres Benitez Annual Award. In 2012, honored at the 79th NRCP Awards for her contributions to cultural research of literature, folklore, linguistics, 
and History of the Philippines. In 2013, she won the 21st Tab 1 Literary Award or World of Women's Poetry for Subbuanan Balak. Good day everyone again. I'm Lovely J. Bernizo. We'll now move on to her poem entitled Patay na Tood si Maria Clara. Alburo's poem is shaped to the tradition of Cebuano Balak. It was a very ideal for the Filipino womanhood. This concludes that the poem entitled Patay na Tood si Maria Clara is very essential not only as an anthology of prose fiction gathered from mid 1800s, but its story is acknowledged throughout the 21st century which befalls and captivates young readers not to be silenced by any groups who arrogates unto themselves the power of literature and here's miss fajardo to read the english translation of patay na tood si maria clara let me read to you the wonderful english translation of the poem maria clara is dead indeed I, you mean that pale sweetheart of the betrayed Chrysostomo Ibarra? According to Mama, she was a model, always plucking the harp, shy, cooked delicious ham dishes, somewhat slow, kissed the elders' hands after novena, obedient, and most many other adjectives that today we find difficult to spell. Perhaps there's no more harp left, it's expensive to cook a ham dish, and isn't it boring to always pray the novena? Let whoever want to be a saint suffer. What a woman needs now is to compose the song she will play. Be quick to finish the food she'll serve. Proceed even without a blessing. If mama were still alive, what would she say? That Maria Clara is deader than she is. A pity. And now we have Barnizo Lovely again here to present the rhyming pattern, syllabic structure, and figurative language of the poem. Let's proceed first to the rhyming pattern. Rhyming pattern, or we call it as a rhyme scheme, it is the pattern of sounds that repeats at the end of a line or stanza. Rhyme schemes can change line by line, stanza by stanza, or can continu continue throughout a poem. Here in the poem, there are only three rhymes or it symbolize, symbolized as the letter A, B, or C at the end of each line. First is the letter A which is in the 1st, 2nd, and 9 to 11th lines that have the same rhyme. The next one is letter B, and as you read the poem, the word on, which is in the 3rd to 8th and 12 to 16 lines that have the same rhyme. And lastly, the letter C, which is in the 17th and 18th lines that have the same rhyme as you can see in your screen. Now let's proceed to the syllabic structure of the poem. What is syllabic structure? Syllabic structure is the pattern which essentially characterizes how many consonants may occur before the vowel in a syllable and how many after the vowel. As we count the syllables of words in each line of the poem, in your screen you can see the results of syllabic structure. 12, 14, 12, 13, 12, 15, 13, 13, 13, 14, and 16, 16, 11, 15, 13, 11, and 18, 19. Next is figurative language. Figurative language that is used in this poetry is a metaphor. A metaphor is a phrase describing something as something it is not in reality. It is used to compare two things symbolically the example from the poem is that Maria Clara is deeper than she is a pity. Next is that theme or moral. The theme of the poem is characterized by a strong narrative strategy, which is close to the tradition of Cebuano Bala. The central theme of the poem conveys female empowerment. It perceives the gender roles of women in the past era and now in the present age. Furthermore, it breaks the, it breaks the stereotype of the perception in women that they are shy, obedient, and only bound to portray a role in the kitchen. At the end of the poetry, she emphasized the idea of a hardworking woman 
A modern woman of our generation strives to compose a song and not just play a sharp gracefully. A lady that is resourceful to provide sufficient food on the table. Through literature, Erlinda Alburo wanted to tell the world that a woman's identity should not be limited to a traditional modest Maria Clara. In fact, the last line of the poem indicates that Maria Clara is indeed dead in this generation, and it is a positive change. For the symbolism, the poem Patay na Tood si Maria Clara deconstructs the traditional notion of the obedient, shy, soft, and serene Filipina woman. It represents the idea of independent women in this new generation. The line, it is expensive to cook a ham dish, symbolizes that woman in our era is now financially intelligent and aware. Furthermore, it concludes with a dare operating on re reverse psychology. Whoever still wants to be sane, we will let her suffer. The poem's conclusion is a manifesto for liberation. What a woman needs now is to know how to compose the song she will play. Be quick in finding the, hook, the food she'll give. Move even without a blessing. This powerful place, praise implies that being strategic, well-educated, prompt, and competent is now the new attribute of a modern woman. Alburo's poem ends with the speaker asking, if mother were still around, what would she have said? The discourse concludes with an idiomatic word that might signify both I, what a pity and good for her. It also points to the double meaning of to odd, which can function both as a noun meaning dead, dead wood and as an adverb meaning indeed. And here's Miss Fajardo again to introduce a trivia from Region 7. Trivia time! Before we head to the second destination, what you should know about Cebu. In 1994, Republic Act 7698 declared August 6th of every year as a special non-working holiday in Cebu. Furthermore, did you know that one Philippine president died in Cebu? On March 17, 1957, President Ramon Magsaysay <clears throat> was on his way back to Manila. On March 17, 1957, President Ramon Magsaysay was on his way back to Manila after visiting Cebu City. Unfortunately, the Mount Pinatubo, a Douglas C-47 plane carrying Magsaysay and 25 other people crashed on Mount Manangal in the town of Balamban, Cebu. And, and that is here for, and that's all for the trivia time. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to Miss Yvette and Miss Mariela. Today, we are here to present and we will be discussing the 21st century literature from the, from the Philippines and the world performance task. Let's hear the presentation for Region 8. To discuss, may I call on Miss Agliday. Good day, everyone. I'm Trisha Agliday and I introduce to all of you the Eastern Visayas. Eastern Visayas is an administrative region in the Philippines designated as Region 8. It consists of three main islands, Samar, Leyte, and Biliran. Eastern Visayas faces the Philippine Sea to the east. The region's most famous landmark is the San Juanico Bridge, which links the province of Samar and Leyte. As of 2020, the Eastern Visayas region has a population of 4,547,150 inhabitants, making it the third most populous region in the Visayas. And I will introduce the famous author, Fernando Beiser. Fernando Beiser is also known as Floripinas. He is 142 years old, was born in Canlunangan, Leyte on the 30th of May, 1879. Beiser suffered stroke on the 16th of November, 1944, and died in Timamana, Mainit, Surigao at the age of 67. He was a Filipino Visayan poet, writer, and bishop of the Philippine Independent Church. 
He was best known as the inventor of the Cebuano sonnet form called Sonanoy. Fernando by Sir. Later, he married in Doña Bruna Aranas in Leyte, becoming the first religious priest to be wed. In 1930, he was ordained bishop by Gregorio Aglipay and the new role, uh, role allowed Mindanao as well as to help in the religious reform initiated by Aglipay. And, for, and to discuss his literary works and achievement, may I call Levin John. Good day, everyone. My name is Levin John, J. Punong Baya. Thank you, Ms. Trisha. The literary works, Ang Suga in 1906, Para sa, sa, sa mga balak in write readings of poem in 1936, Kasing-kasing sa magbabala, Heart of Poet in 1938. Kasakit Ugg Kalipay, Who's Bliss in 1940. Balangaw, Rainbow in 1941. Cristo Gikawa, Christ Has Been Stolen in Lucia in 1912. Baili Official, Official Dance in 1913. Panimulos sa Isa Ka Aswang, Exploits of a Vampire in 1923. Mga Damgo sa Isa Ka Pari. Dreams of Priest in 1913. Dungog sa Kamatayon, Honor of Death in 1926. His achievement, he was credited for the invasion of Tunanoy, a Cebuano poetic from Akin to English sonnet. All thought altern alternative etymology was Sonata Nga Mananoy, harmonious melody to, to the non adherence to the sonnet poetic structure. The innovation utilizing Sanano influenced the work of next generation of Cebuano poets. Good day, everyone. My name is Dennis Isidel, my end first. Let's talk about the summary of the Bakunawa and the Seven Moons. Bakunawa is a gigantic sea serpent gently of the deep and the underworld who is often considered as a cause of eclipse. It was once known to be beautiful goddess who lived at the bottom of the sea. She was mesmerized by the light that, that was shining. She went up and saw the moon so beautiful. For the characters, Character, Bakunawa, Batala, Seven Moons. Characteristics, a huge serpent like a dragon, a supreme being or god, beautiful as a James. For the settings, Eastern Ocean, where Bakunawa live, on a summer night, cave and surface of the moon. Theme, during ancient times, pre-colonials and Bumanias believed that their are seven moons created by their supreme gods to light up the sky. The Bakunawa are amazed by the beauty, would rise from the ocean and swallow the moon's whole, and green Bathala and causing them to be mortal enemies. Moral. The more the Bakunawa's moral is love does not always prevail. For the plot, during lunar eclipse in the Asian of Philippines, it was believed that a monstrous dragon known as Bakunawa was attempting to swallow the moon. For the exposition, the Bakunawa, a huge serpent like a dragon that collided around the earth and ruled the oceans, first fell in love with the heavenly magnificent of the seven sisters, such as such that he invited the Almighty for his creations. And to the people's collective dismay, the dragon swallowed the moon the moons one by one each night as he yearned to possess them all. This growing yearning turned into envy and into greed. So as the Bakunawa arose again and again from what from the waters to swallow the moons until until the towering dragon devoured all but one. And for the rising action 
I would like to call Mr. Thank you, Mr. Genesis. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Juan Miguel Anipan, and I'm here to continue the literary analysis of the tale of Bakunawa. On rising action, the Batala became conscious of the sudden disappearance of the moons from the heavens as the last remaining was the sight of a dismay to the people of Earth. They, in turn, learned to arm themselves to protect it from being swallowed by the dragon. Hence, the dragon not only termed as a moon eater, but as a man eater as well. Climax. One night, deafening screams, moans, music, sounds, and banging of drums coming from the people of Earth awakened the Almighty to witness the Bakonawa swallowing the last moon, slowly enveloping the whole world in abysmal darkness. People shouted all together and they screamed, Return our moon! among many other unpleasant words. On falling action, the dragon hastily retreated to his caverns in the ocean as the sound grew louder and louder, and the last moon illuminated the dark skies once more, and the people of Earth rejoiced as the dragon hastily returned to the east, hiding inside his cave and waiting for another right moment to gobble the last remaining moon. In resolution, the dragon never gave up, as he would attempt to swallow the last remaining moon in the sky from time to time. But the people remain on alert if such an incident is to happen again, ready to create thundering noises for the moon's return, guarding it with their lives, and as long as the bamboo trees are not killed on, on the moon, the dragon will never succeed in its malicious deeds. Sensory images. On sensory images, for the sense of sight, we have the Bakunawa, a huge serpent-like dragon that coiled around the earth and ruled the ocean. Every evening was ever so bright and beautiful because of these moons, as the moons brought joy and happiness to the people of earth. The last moon illuminated the dark skies once more and the people of Earth rejoiced as the dragon hastily returned to the feast, hiding in his cave and waiting for another right moment to gobble the last remaining moon. Patala planted bamboos that looked like things on the surface of the moon from afar. <coughs> the trees can be seen. The bamboo trees can be seen as dark spots in the face of the moon. For the sense of hearing, we have one night, deafening screams, moans, music, sounds, and banging of drums coming from the people of Earth awaken the Almighty to witness the Bakunawa swallowing the last moon. The dragon hastily retreated to his cavern as the sound grew louder and louder. But the people remain on alert if such an incident is to happen again, ready to create thundering noises for the moon's return, guarding it with their life. There is no sensory images for touch, taste, and smell. Moving on to symbolism, seven moons symbolizes beauty and happiness. Pakunawa represents greed, envy, and evilness. The last moon represents hope, or the last hope of humanity. That's the end of literary analysis of Tale of Bakunawa, written by Fernando Weiser together with Damania Eugenio. That's all for Region 8. Thank you, Ms. Laglidae, Mr. Anipan, Ms. Udelmo, and Ms. Mr. Unong Bayan for discussing the author's biography, literary works, literary analysis for the Region, region 8.
Hi, hello nyo sa inyo sa inyo lahat. My name is Mark Aldrin P. Saranas from 12 ADMC 82. Good afternoon po. This, our, this is our group, um, Region 9, 10, and 11. We're the group 5. So, today, I will be your loudest, most composed leader of group 5. So, enough about me. Let me introduce about my smart, beloved group mates. Let's start it from Edsel Hidalgo, Arjane Vico, Rosemary Sambo, Aubrey Mendoza, Joshua Opider, Hagay Lomberto, Jasmine Ruelo, Janie Lampa, Christian Magno, and Dresslyn Santiago Adre. And I divided my, our group into three for each region, region 9, 10, and 11. So we could really excel and assess our contribution in this group. Region 9 is, will, be, will be presented by Edsel Hidalgo, Joshua Lopidera, Hagay Lomberto, and Jasmine Rowello. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and we are the Region 9, and we're going to present our chosen author and literary analysis. Now, here is Mr. Hagay Lumberto to introduce the facts of Region 9. Region 9, officially designated as the Zamboanga Peninsula, is an administrative region in the Philippines occupying the western section of Mindanao. It consists of three provinces, namely Zamboanga del Norte, Zamboanga del Sur, and Zamboanga Zibugay, and five cities, namely Isabel, Isabela, Dapitan, Dipolog, Pagadian, and Zamboanga City. The Zamboanga Peninsula was also previously known as Western Mindanao before the enactment of Executive Order No. 36 on September 19, 2001. Over. Zamboanga Peninsula has the first export processing zone in Mindanao. Farming and fishing are the main economic activities of the region. Over. It also has rice and corn mills, oil processing and coffee berry processing and processing of latex from rubber. Over. Its home industries include rattan and furniture craft, basket making, weaving, and brass work. Over. In Zamboanga Peninsula, about one-third of the region's population is composed of ethnic people. They are generally divided into the Tausugs, Yakans, Bajaus, Samals, and the Subanons. The languages spoken around the region are Chavacano, Cebuano or Bisaya, Tagalog, Maranao, and Subanon. Over. Zamboanga Peninsula has numerous festivals where the localities and tourists can celebrate and enjoy, one of which is the Sibug Sibug Festival in Zamboanga Sibugay to commemorate the founding of the province and to give thanks to their patron. The highlight of the feast is the Talaba Longest Grill. It is also famous because of the juiciest, meatiest, and the most delicious taste of Sibugay oysters. Over. And now for our representative for Region 9, we decided Emigdio Mig Alvarez Enriquez to be our representative. He is a Filipino author from Zamboanga City in the Philippines whose most well-known works include The Devil's Flowers, published in 1959, and The Dal, published in 1953. He was born in the year of 1925. Over. He began writing when he was... 20 years old. He is a novelist and a storyteller. He has also written five plays, three of which are considered Philippine epics by many, while the other two were about liberation. All five were released in 1991 and they are his last known works. Emigdio Enriquez's The Dal is a simple, beautifully written short story with a significant message for the parents of the world. It also exposes the shallowness of the machismo culture instilled of the locals by their colonial masters. Over.
And now here is Joshua Peder to read our chosen story, The Dawn. Good afternoon, everyone. So this is the summary story of The Doll. The story is about a child who is brought up wrongly. The story started at Don Endong accusing his wife, Donya Enchang, for giving their son, Narciso, a doll to play with. Donya Enchang always wanted a daughter, so he grew her son's hair and let him play with dolls. As a result, the father always scolds his son for his feminine ways. Don Endong feared that his son will grow as a homosexual despite him bragging that he has passed the red blood of masculinity to his son. Don and Dong kept saying that a boy should be masculine, that once a girl shows a romantic interest in him, he should brut sexually brutalize the girl. Narcissa grew up with this mother, mother's religious doings, with his father's always taunting and making fun of it. As the image of Lady Fatima from Portugal is coming to their town, Donya Enchang is selected as the chairman of the reception. When the lady came, Narciso was being mistaken by the people as a girl, and so he demanded his hair to be cut short, as it appears that the lady of Fatima will also mistake him for a girl, which his mother refused to do. When the bishop laid his hands on Narciso, he sprang up to manhood, and bishop praised him for being a brave boy. When Narciso grew up, he turned to be the different person. At the age of 19, he told his parents that he wanted to be a priest, to his mother's delight, but his father's horror. Don Endong believed that being a priest is such a waste of masculinity. Having banter with his father, he went to the seashore to calm himself. He met a woman who is very willing to have a sexual moment with him. He forces himself aggressively to the woman and sexually brutalizes her. Two men drag him out and curse at him. Having done such act, Narciso is proud of himself. Why so? For proving to his father that he is now masculine and that he have followed what Don and Dong have always said over. And now, here is Miss Jasmine Ruello and yours truly to discuss the literary analysis. Now, we will discuss the literary analysis of the short story entitled The Doll. First is the characters and its characteristics. Narciso. He is the main protagonist of the story. He is the son of Don and Dong and Don and Chang. He plays with doll and has long curly hair. He is a very respectful kid but has his own stand with his decisions and opinions. In the short story, Narciso is a round character. Over. Next is Don and Dong. Don and Dong is also known as Marido. He is the father of Narciso and the husband of Don and Chang. He is a man full of masculinity. He is very hard-mouthed and spiteful. In the short story, Don and Dong is a flat character. Over. Next is Don and Chang. She is the wife of Don and Dong and the mother of Narciso. She is the one who permits Narciso to play with dolls and have long curly hair. Don Yen Chang is a religious woman and a soft-spoken woman. In the story, Don Yen Chang is a flat character. Over. Last is the woman by the sea. The woman by the sea is seductive and alluring. She is the woman who is sexually abused by Narciso. Over. Now that we know the characters and its characteristics, let me introduce the setting of the story. The setting of the story happened in their home and in their town by the dock of Evelyn. Over. This is our flat analysis, the exposition of the story. There is a boy named Narciso. His mother calls him to sing and grew his hair and let him play with dolls. However, his father opposes his mother's decision. That's why his father calls him boy, for him to be reminded that he is a man with a male specimen and, she, and he should not have a weak soul. Over.
The rising action of the story started when Don and Dong broke the doll Narciso used to play and scolded him to stop being feminine. He also blames his wife for what his son have become. Over. Another rising action also occurs when the image of the Lady of Fatima arrive at their town. People mistaken boy for being a girl. But the bishop take away his doubt and tell him that he is a brave boy. Over. And because of that, when Narcisa grew up, he wanted to be a priest. He believes that being a priest is a noblest profession on earth. When he tells his decision to his parents, his mother was delighted. But his father refuses to let him serve God. Because for his father, it will not use of his masculinity in its full potential. His father also added that he would rather die than see his son become a priest. Because of that argument, Narcisa visits the seashore to calm himself. And at that moment, a woman approached him and displayed an interest for intimacy. Over. The climax of the story happens after engaging himself with the woman. He sexually brutalizes her. He forcefully engages himself to the point that he abused a woman. The following action of the story was when Narciso had killed the woman. The woman was defected to be sprawled grotesquely on the floor. It was the moment that to prove his father wrong of him being a male, he, he totally abused a woman. The resolution of the story happens when two men drag Narciso out of the sea. And as he stands and inhales the fresh air, he remembers what his father always told him. He felt fulfilled as he thinks he is now a real man. Despite of him abusing a woman, he is proud of himself because for because for now he finally he finally he finally met his father's expectation of what a real man should be. Now that we know the characters, characteristics, settings, and plot of the story, we, Mr. Edsel Hidalgo will discuss the theme, moral of the story, the sensory imagery, and the symbolism. Over. Good afternoon again. Now I'm here to discuss the theme. The theme of the story is about family and beliefs. It tackles the impact and importance of parents to the holistic growth of their children. It also presents the meaning of the saying, what you see is what you do. Because for Narciso, to be accepted by his father as a real man, he does the things that his father shows him of what a real man should do to the point that he should sexually brutalize a woman. The story also shows the importance of allowing a person to have the freedom to choose who they want to be and not be incarcerated with the norms built by society. Finally, it also showed the different views of people about religious beliefs, being that we are colonized by the Spaniards for 333 years. Over. For the moral of the story, we have observed three important morals. First, the importance of respect and humility inside a family. Respect is a vital aspect in a healthy relationship, such as a healthy family. Respect branches out to love, care, affection, and trust. We have been taught since our childhood to obey and respect our parents because all they want is the best for us, for us to be always safe from danger and be successful. On the other hand, parents must accept their children for who they are, their preferences and opinions, and must be the first ones to support them until the end. Over. The second moral is diminishing the toxic stereotypes of society. We should start breaking the labeling of things as either masculine or feminine. We must not stop a male if he wants to wear makeup, nor stop a female if she wants to have short or shaved hair. Not all people born male would like the things and jobs designed for them by the toxic community. Not all people are the same, and it is about time to stop calling out individuals for being different. Over. And the final moral we have observed is gender discrimination. If men should be strong and women can feel emotions, then women could be strong and men should feel emotions. We should accept that not all men will be perceived as the strong big guy who looks intimidating and feisty. That there will be times when they would break down and despair. On the other hand, not all women are weak and emotional individuals who rely on men and they can be as strong as the pillars of the greatest temples. 
over. Now let's go over to the sensory imagery. First, for the sight. His father was excessively masculine, from the low broad forehead and the thick bushy brows to the wide cleft chest and the ridged abdomen beneath it. Number two, there were the colegialas in their jumpers and cotton stockings, the Ateneo band and cadets in khaki and white mittens, the caballeros de colon with their ponches and their bald heads, the hijas de maria with their medals, the apostolados with their scapulars, the liga de mujeres with their beads. Number three, the feeble light of a single electric bulb lit the veranda where boy stood facing his father in his wicker chair, but the yellow light was flat on the boy's face and Don and Dong saw that it was a dead mask, except for the eyes which held a pointed brilliance. For the auditory, number one, like when Mr. Wilson's ice plant siren blew the hour of 12, number two, the boy's voice was as taut as the string of an instrument that is about to snap. Number three, except for the muffled cry of a haji in the distant Mora village and the mournful beat of an ago. For the olfactory, a strong, sweetly pungent scent invaded his nostrils. And for the tactile, number one, fingers touched him lightly on the shoulder, a little nervously, like birds about to take flight at the least sign of danger, fingers deep into his sensitive flesh. And number two, clean air of morning swept against his face. We cannot find any sensory imagery for gustatory or taste. Over. And the final part of the literary analysis is symbolisms. The first symbolism we found is the doll. It symbolizes the standard view of people about gender. The doll also represents what Donya and Chang wanted Narciso to be, and also the woman whom he sexually brutalized at the end. Over. The second symbolism is Mary of Fatima. She signifies the faith and willingness of Donya and Chang to have a daughter. Over. The third symbolism is fresh air. It symbolizes the burden of Narciso, the belief that he meets the expectation created by his father of what a real man should do that tormented him for a long time. Over. And lastly, priesthood. It symbolizes the desire of Narciso to be a full man. He believes that no homosexuals become religious leaders and it is the noblest profession on earth. And that is all for Region 9. We hope that you have learned something new from our author, his work, and our literary analysis. Now let's go over to Region 10. Thank you. Good job, grade. Good job, Region 9. So now let's proceed to Region 10, conducted by RJ Liko. Aubrey Mendoza, Janie Lampa, and Christian Marino. Good day, I'm Janie Lampa and I'll talk about the biography of Jose Lacaba. But before that, let me share some trivia and facts about the Region 10 over. Region 10 is known for showing that the citizens of Region 10 value camaraderie and friendship. Some parts of this region are known to have preserved their tribal beliefs and customs. An example is the Higaunon Mountain Tribe in Bukidnon. Over. The economy of Northern Mindanao is the largest regional economy in the island of Mindanao. Over. The famous Del Monte, Philippines, located in the province of Pukidnon and its processing plant is located in Cagayan de Oro, which shipped to the entire Philippines and Asia-Pacific region. The Agus 4 to 7 hydroelectric plants in Iligan and Baloy Lanao del Norte supplies most of its electrical power in Mindanao. Some of the products that come from Region 10 are coconut oil, fresh pineapple, and cane raw sugar. Over.
The region town representative is Jose Maria Flores Lacaba, popularly known as Pete Lacaba, was born in Misamis Oriental on November 25, 1945, over. He is the son of Jose Monreal Lacaba of Laon Bohol and Fe Flores from Pateros Rizal, over. He is a Filipino film writer, editor, poet, screenwriter, translator, and journalist. While he was studying AB English at Ateneo de Manila University, he dropped out of school and the next year, he joined the Philippine Free Press. He worked as a copy editor and proofreader and later as a staff writer and editor of the magazine's Filipino edition. He was also recognized for his coverage of anti-Marcos movement called the First Quarter Storm in 1970. During martial law, Lacaba is among the brave souls who fought against President Marcos and his cruel dictatorship. As one of the many activists in prison during dictator Ferdinand Marcos' rule, he was arrested and incarcerated in 1974. Lacaba was tortured by police and military operatives trying to extract incriminating information about his suspected comrades over the course of his two-year detention over. Under the nom de plume, Ruben Cuevas, Lacaba published his poem, Prometheus Unbound at Focus, a publication that supported the Marcos government over. And now, let's hear it from Ms. Biko, the other information of Mr. Lacaba. Good day, everyone. Arjun Biko speaking. Lacaba is currently the executive editor of Summit Media CS Magazine, the sister publication of PEP, Philippine Entertainment Portal, over... His screenplays credits include Jaguar, which competed at the Cannes International Film Festival in 1980. Ricky Lee co-wrote Jaguar with Lacaba over. While Bayad Ko Kapit Sa competed in 1984 over. Ora Pronobis, or also known as Fight for Us, was screened out of competition in 1989. Over. In honor of Lacaba for being the 2008 Lifetime Achievement Awardee, the classic film Bayan Ko was screened as the closing film of Decada Cine Manila. Bayan Ko could be found in Toronto, Canada. Truly, he's one of the leading figures in Filip Philippine literature today. He collaborated on films with well-known filmmakers such as Lino Broca and Mike De Leon, exposing the lives of exposing the lives of ordinary people who had been affected by poverty and injustice. Over. His screen, his poetry collection includes Sa Daig ng Kodradiksyon, 1991, Sa Panahon ng Ligalig, 1991, and Ang kagilas-gilas sa pakikipagsapalaran ni Juan de la Cruz, 1970s, which will be discussed in this presentation by Ms. Mendoza. But before we proceed to that, let us hear from Ms. Lampa the awards and achievements of Mr. Lacaba. The Awards of Mr. Lacaba Star Awards for Movies Star Award Adapted Screenplay of the Year for Results of the Pitan, 1998. Metro Manila Film Festival. Festival Prize, Best Screenplay for Results of the Pitan, 1997. Gawad Urian Awards. Best Screenplay for Jaguar, 1980. Best Screenplay for Sister Stella L, 1985. Best Screenplay for Bayan Ko, Kapit sa Patalim, 1986. Best Screenplay for Sigurista, 1997, AFAP Awards, Philippines, Best Story Adaptation for Bayan Ko, Kapit sa Patalim, 1986, FAMAS Awards, Best Screenplay for Rizal Sadapitan, 1998, 
And now, here is Ms. Mendoza to discuss the poem of Mr. Lacaba entitled Ang Mga Kagilagilalas na Pakikipagsapalara ni Juan de la Cruz. The work we have selected is a poem entitled Ang Mga Kagilagilalas na Pakikipagsapalara ni Juan de la Cruz. It was the first play poem or tuladula to be performed, where the poem is recited by the narrator while the other actors play the roles. Lacaba wrote this poem in 1970s during Ferdinand Marcos' regime. It portrayed the situation of the Philippines at that time as well as the feelings of the Filipino people. So before I proceed, we prepared a video of Jose Lacaba reciting his poetry. Isang gabing madilim, unong ng pangambang sumakay sa bus, si Juan de la Cruz. Pusturang-pustura kahit walang laman ang bulsa. Bawal manigarilyo, boss, sabi ng magdoktora at minura si Juan de la Cruz. Pusturang-pustura kahit walang laman ang bulsa. Nilakad ni Juan de la Cruz ang buong mabinida. Bawal kumarada, sabi ng kalsada. Bawal umihi dito, sabi ng bakot. Kaya napagod si Juan de la Cruz. Nangabutan ng gutom si Juan de la Cruz, tumapat sa mamunlok na moyang mangisyo paul lumpia pangsit hanggang sa mabusog. Nagdaan sa sinig na lisay, tinitigan ng retrato ni Chichay, passes not honor today, sabi ng takibyera, tawa ng tawa. Dumalo sa kongreso si Juan de la Cruz, mag-iingat sa aso, sabi ng diputado, Nagtumul, nagtuloy sa Malacanang, wala namang dalang kamanyang. Keep off the grass, sabi ng hardinero, sabi ng sundalo, kay Juan de la Cruz. Nanggapuan ng libog si Juan de la Cruz na masyal sa kulikuli at nahulog sa kusali, parang ispadang bali-bali. Your credit is good, but we need cash, sabi ng bugaw, sabay higop ng sabaw. Pusturang-pustura kahit walang laman ng bulsa, naglibot sa duwi si Juan de la Cruz. Para ang besa ay saboy, they satisfy, sabi ng neon. Humikap ang dagat na parang leon. Masarap sanang tumalon, pero bawal magtapo ng basura, sabi ng alon. Nagbalik sa kiyapo si Juan de la Cruz at medyo kinakabahan, pumasok sa simbahan. In God we trust, sabi ng obispo, all others pay cash. Nang wala nang malunok si Juan de la Cruz, daladalay gulok, gulagulanit na ang damit, wala pa rin laman ang bulsa, umakyat sa araya ang namayat na si Juan de la Cruz. Wanted dead or alive, sabi ng PC, at sinisi ang walang hiyang kabataan kung bakit sinulusulan ang isang tahimik na mamamayan tulad ni Juan de la Cruz. Ah, hindi ba ako naman italyano? Pero italyano kasi. For the literary analysis, the theme of the poem are journey, activism, and governance. The poem depicted the situation of the Philippines and it addressed the problems in society during a time when discrimination and inequality were prevalent. So basically, when we read the poem, some people may think that it is just about an ordinary journey of an ordinary person. But as we try to study and find the structures of the text, we can see that it implies something. To summarize, it tells the journey of Juan de la Cruz, who lived in province but eventually moved to city. However, as he travels everywhere, he is always hindered by circumstances until he became really miserable in the city. So at the end, he decided to go to the mountain, or the Arayat, as what is mentioned in the poem, and there he joined the rebels, or the activists, who are against the government, to bring a political or social change. And that's where the poem ends. For the structure of the poem, the syllabic structure is free verse. As what we have analyzed, it is an open form of poetry. He didn't follow a particular pattern or formal, of, or formal structure. Instead, 
he wrote the poem with his own initiative, consisting of different numbers of verses and lines. For the rhyming structure, there is no rhyme scheme used in the poem. Although he used rhyming words in several parts of his poetry, but he didn't exactly follow a specific and consistent pattern of sounds. For figurative language, in several parts of the poem, ordinary sentence is used to convey meaning without directly stating it. Figures of speech such as simile, personification, and anaphora were used. The line parang espadang balibali, which he used to characterize himself, is an example of simile. Kumikab ang dagat na parang leon is an example of personification. For anaphora, he used repeating phrases in every verse, which is the Pusturang pustura kahit walang laman ang butsa. And lastly, for symbolism, Juan de la Cruz symbolizes every Filipino. Kabataan symbolizes the student activists. Congreso and Balacanang symbolizes the government. And lastly, Arayat represents the mountain where the activists were found. And that's the end of our region 10. And now let's proceed to the last region, which is the region 11. Hello, good afternoon. It's me again, Aldrin Serenas. Region 11 is our work. So uh, before we start for our Region 11 representative, let me tell you some facts and uh, trivia about Region 11. Aside from being the region where the infamous current president of the Philippines, Rodrigo Duterte, came from, Region 11 is famous for its rich mineral resources. For its rich re mineral resources, is and Region 11 is famous for reserves of gold, copper, manganese, and nickel are found in this part of the country. Lying at the southeastern corner of the Philippines, Davao City is considered the orchid capital of the Philippines. Region 11 is the home of Mount Apo, the highest mountain in the Philippines. It is also known locally as Apo Sandawa, a large sulfataric dormant stratovolcano. The region's name is derived from its Bagobo origins. The Bagobos were indigenous to the Philippines. The word Davao came from the phonetic blending of three Bagobo subgroups named for the Davao River. A major waterway emptying into the Davao Gulf near the city. So, this is our Region 11 representative. Let's hear it from the beautiful Rosemary Sambo. Thank you, Serenas. Today, everyone, I'm Rosemary Sambo, and let's talk about Candy Girl Lay's biography. She was, her former name is Candy Kilpo. She was born on April 19, 1962, in Davao City, Philippines. She went to an all-girls convent school called St. Teresa's College, Quezon City. Candy's professions are journalists and children's, children's book author. Her first writing job was on Stork News. Mostly, she wrote about her dogs and her little brothers and her life in Manila. She became a writer, but for a long time, she re realized that she's not fit as a reporter for newspapers and magazines. While she works as a reporter, she didn't earn much money, so she decides to draw a weekly cartoon strip for a women's magazine and took photographs. She joined to SCBWI or also known as Scooby. This is the group of writers and illustrators for children who spend a little of time moaning about how hard it is to get published. Scooby had the competition for unpublished authors and published an anthology of, the, of all the winners. They choose Ugly City, her novel, as one of the winners. She is a Filipino author based in the United Kingdom who has been shortlisted for the Carnage Medal. From 1984 to 1989, she worked as a journalist 
in the Philippines. After she spent a year as a journalist, she went to the United Kingdom and lived there at the age of 20. Over. Her first debuted novel is Tall Story. Her book named Tall Story was shortlisted for 13 prizes, was notably the Waterstones Children's Book Prize, the Branford Bose Award, the Blue Peter Book Award, and the UKLA Children's Book Prize. Tall Story was nominated for the Carnage Medal. Her second novel is Shine of 2013 was long listed for the Guardian Children's Fiction Prize and won the Crystal Kite Award for British Isles in 2014. And her last novel is Bone Talk of 2018 was shortlisted for the Costa Book Awards and the CILIP Carnage Medal. Over. Her other published books are Hinabing Gunita or Woven Memories, Animal Tricksters, Might Falls Up, her upcoming books, ex expected date on January 6, 2022, Ferdinand Magellan, Is It a Mermaid? And now let's call Raslin Adre for the literary analysis. Thank you, Rosemary Samba. This is Raslin Cheryl Adre to discuss the literary analysis of the tall story by Candy Gurley. But before we proceed to that, first, let's watch the trailer. I have a big brother. He doesn't live with us. He lives on the other side of the world. I have a little sister. She lives in London. Mum says my brother's tall. That's cool. Maybe we can play basketball. I used to be the smallest in my class. Not anymore. I love basketball. I wish I could play it all the time. I wish I was in London with my sister. Tall story. What you want is not, not always what you get, even when your wishes come true. Andy is short and she has lots of wishes. She wishes she could play on the school basketball team. She wishes for her own bedroom. But most of all, she wishes she wishes that her long lost half brother, Bernardo, could come and live in London where he belongs. Then Andy's biggest wish comes true and she's minutes away from becoming someone's little sister. As she waits anxiously for Bernardo to arrive from the Philippines, she hopes he'll turn out to be tall and just as crazy as she is about basketball. When he finally arrives, he's tall all right. Eight feet tall, in fact, plagued by condition called gigantism and troubled by secrets that he believes led to his phenomenal growth. In a noble pack with quirkiness and humor, Gurley explores a touching sibling relationship and the clash of two very, of two very different, different cultures. Over... Here are the literary analysis of the tall story by Candy Gurley. First is the character and characteristics. The main characters are Bernardo, super tall man. He is nice and always wants to help his half-sister Andy. Andy is a girl who is mad about basketball. She is the half-sister of Bernardo. Over. Next is the settings. The story is set in London and the Philippines. Over. Next is the plot. First is the exposition. A boy, very tall, named Bernardo and his half-sister half named Andy. Bernardo can't leave Philippines and Andy lives in London. She likes playing basketball and she imagines her brother that is so tall could be into the ball game also. Over. Next is the rising action. In the Philippines, 
an earthquake appeared, everyone thought Bernardo saved them from the earthquakes in the Philippines. Bernardo then moves to London when he got a tumor but doesn't know it. Over. Next is the climax. Bernardo went to play his basketball game but finds out about his condition. After a while, Bernardo fainted and is brought to the emergency room. While at the game, the basketball team let Andy join the basketball game. She took the strikes that got them into the victory. Over. Next is the falling action. When the surgery ends, Andy hugs Nardo. He noticed Andy's jersey and asked why she's wearing it. Andy answered that they just won the game. Over. Lastly is the resolution. As Andy made it into the ball, into the old boys team, they found out that everything is fine. Nardo is in good condition and everyone is safe from the from the quake. Over. Next, let's hear from Mark Aldridge Serenas, the team, the sensory imagery, and lastly, the symbolism. Hello everyone, you must be tired of me now, pero yes, I, am, I will be discussing the theme and the moral of the story. The moral of the story is that regardless of your gender, height, or anything other thing that will hinder you, you should not let those interf interfere on what you want in life. The story reminds us all that in every situation or disasters we're in, remember to not surrender. Andy is a representation of a powerful woman. And she did not let the you can join play basketball because you are the you are a girl and you are small mentality. Uh, other moral of the story is making a good connection and relation with your relatives. The sensory imagery, hearing at night when everything was silent, I could hear a soft noise, creak, creak, creak. There was a sharp whistling noise. The kettle was boiling in the kitchen. My, vo my voice sounded far away, like it was coming from outside on the landing. I sat outside on the landing listening hard, but they never raised their voices loud enough for me to hear. Sight. The international airport building was fancy enough. As she drew near, her eyes grew wider, but the look on her face was not that of amazement. The oily estate agent had taken us to see the house only last week. She saw a comet flashing through the sky and she made a wish, staring at mom's photo photograph on the wall. Touch, put my arms around her and she stood on her toes and reached up to my shoulder. Ma pressed her lips together. Congratul congratulations on your new home and shaking hands with the shaking hands. Smell, breathing in the aroma of sweaty armpits, dirty rubber balls, unchanged socks, and old retainers. Symbolism. I only included one symbolism here in our letter analysis because I think this is the most suitable one. Bernardo's Jagentism. Symbolizes the importance of seeing each other as the same. No matter what differences we have, we are all people who is ex who are experiencing the same things. Andy never looked at Bernardo as different. Instead, when she first met him, she immediately noticed her their similarities, which is their eyes. This symbolizes that we are all equal and should treat each other equally. Um. It doesn't, doesn't mean that you're tall and that you're so above of everyone. But in, in this case, Bernardo's gigantism and, and this small height did not hinder her for joining the men's, volley, men's basketball team. And that's it. This is this are 
our references. And thank you for listening. That's basically it. Three region, three representative, three stories, and three talented humans. Let's hear it from Edsel Hidalgo and RJ Vico. Yes, that's all. But thank you both for listening, and we hope you have learned something from our proposed authors and their literary literary works and the literary analysis. Thank you. Region twelve. Hi, my name. Jaime Anlim is a Filipino contemporary writer born in Gagayan de Oro City on January 7, 1946. He is a multi-awarded essayist, poet, and mentor, and at the same time, a historian and story writer. He graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in English from Mindanao State University, or MSU, in 1968. Next slide po. His literary works, which mostly consist of poems, novels, essays, and short fiction, are well known for depicting and narrating Filipino life and culture in the midst of globalization and the effects of foreign cultures that are, progressi that are progressively infiltrating Philippine society. Next slide, Pop. Some of his works, The Liberation of Mrs. Fidel Magsilang, the Changing of the Guard, Yasmin, The Boy in the Tree of Time, Son, The Axolotl Colony. Next slide. So his awards and achievements is 2000 Gawad Pambansang Alagad de Balagtas, awarded by the Union ng Mga Manunulat sa Pilipinas for his outstanding achievement in fiction and poetry. Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Poetry Written for Children in 2016. Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Essay in 1989, Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Poetry in 1990, and lastly, Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Short Story in 1973 and received the same award in 1993. Next slide. So for the Region 12, the literary work of Jaime Anlim that we decided to analyze is his short story entitled Son. Here are the characters and the characterization for the story. First is the father. He is the man who is desperately wanted to have a son. He is the father of the four daughters and the son who died inside of his mother's womb. Later on the story, he was diagnosed with liver cancer. The next character is the mother. She is the wife who is pressured by his husband because of his husband's desire to have a son. She bore four daughters consecutively. Next slide po. Next is the son. He is the firstborn child in the family but later came out dead after being born, helplessly entangled with umbilical cord. Next is the four daughters. They are the children of the man and wife after the death of the first baby. Next slide po. So settings. Hospital, where they were told that their son is already two weeks dead inside the mother's womb. Memorial Park, the cemetery where the dead son is buried, a spot that has a lovely view of the illegal bay beyond the treetops of mahogany and pine. Next slide. Next is Palau Market, where they would pick up up a fresh bunch of miniature moms before going to the cemetery. And lastly, Valentine's Day, the day when the father died due to his illness. Next slide. Here is the plot of the story. For the exposition of the story, the story of the son begins with a man who wanted a son desperately. It did not seem to be an unreasonable demand. All young husbands must have wanted a son the same thing, whether they said so or not. A son to bear the family name, to fulfill his own secret lost ambitions, to carry the illusions of immortality. 
So rising action. So because of he of the man wanting to have a son, his pregnant wife felt really pressured because she knows that she cannot just command her body to produce a baby boy. So during the ultrasound session, it came to their knowledge that the wife is carrying a healthy baby boy. All of them were happy and excited by the news, especially the father. Months have passed and the baby is kicking very lively inside his mother's womb as if he's excited to get out from it. But during the ninth month, it quieted down a bit and its movement getting sluggish. Next slide po. For the climax of the story, when the baby was pulled out, it came out very blue in color, signifying that it was two weeks dead in his mother's womb after getting pulled out, helplessly entangled by his umbilical cord. Next slide po. And for the falling action of the story, the woman was grief stricken and the man was devastated. When they embraced their dead son, it was not clear who was consoling and who was being consoled. Later on the memorial park, they picked a spot that got the morning sun and had a lovely view of the elegant bay. Time passed, the sun faded in the background. Same, some days no thought about their son crossed their minds. After eight years, they already had four daughters. The man didn't feel this. The man didn't feel disappointed. Instead, he loved them and enjoyed their bonding, and he seemed content enough now. Months have passed. The father was diagnosed with liver cancer and started to get weaker each day, and his illness changed his appearance a lot. So, resolution. The father knows that he doesn't have much longer days to live, so he gathered his wife and daughters on his deathbed and told them his last wishes. Two weeks after, on Valentine's Day, he died due to his liver cancer. In accordance to his wishes, they buried him next to his son's grave, who actually passed away years ago. For the theme of the story, the theme of the story is about acceptance and love for family since the story talks about how the father desired to have a son but had four daughters instead but still loved them regardless of their gender. Next slide po. Moral of the story. Regardless of the child's gender, parents should love their children no matter what. There are things in our life that we wanted to happen or achieve but, are really, but aren't really meant to be ours. Also, it it is not bad to dream more about something, but let us not forget to be grateful and contented with what we have at the moment. So in the moral of the story, we, le we learn that, that there are things that we wish to have, but it feels like it's not really meant for us. But that doesn't mean that we don't deserve it. It could mean that there is something more to come in our life. But also, as we are in the process of wanting something more, we should also appreciate and see the things that we have at the moment. Next slide po. And last, for the sensory imagery, most of the sensory imagery we found in the story is commonly about the sense of sight. Here are, here are some of the, the imagery we found. First is wife's distended belly. When it was pulled out later, the baby was already blue, very blue and very dead. They picked a spot that got the morning sun and had a lovely view of the elegant bay beyond the three tops of mahogany and pine. Fresh bunch of white miniature moms. Next slide po. There they would sit on the Bermuda grass by the baby's grave and watch the inter-island ship inch into, into harbor or sail toward the horizon for unknown shores. He lost 30 pounds and his skin turned waxen and yellow. His, mo his mouth became so dry. It was coated with a white chalky substance. His face shrunken around his skull. He became all cheekbones and sunken eyes. That's all for the region. Um, Cordillera Administrative Region po. Ayun, can we um can we ha can we hear Miss Cecil Torres to lead the subunit group um the subunit group one po from our group, Miss Cecil? 
Good afternoon, everyone. I am Cecil H. Torres from ABMC IT2, and I am your teacher for today. Good afternoon, grade 12, Gar. Good afternoon, class. Good afternoon, Bo. So first, we will define CAR. Cordillera Administrative Region, or CAR, is rich in Asian culture. Cordillera is one of the prime tourist destinations in the Philippines. It has many spectacular scenic views and enchantingly cool places. The world-famous Banawi Rice Terraces in the province of Ifugao is considered as the eight wonders of the world. Next po. Luisa A. Igloria. Maria Luisa Aguilar Igloria, or also known as Luisa Igloria. She is an author from Cordillera Administrative Region, or CAR. She was born in Baguio on September 3, 1961. She is a poet, author, educator, and a writer. Her husband is Ruben V. Igloria, born in 1964. Her children are Jennifer Patricia A. Carino, born in 1981, July Julia Katrina A. Carino, born in 1983, Josephine Ann A. Carino, born in 1988, and Gabriela Aurora Iglaria, born in 2001. Next po. The Educational Attainment of Maria Luisa Iglaria. Luisa A. Iglaria received her undergraduate degree from the University of the Philippines, Baguio, in 1980. In Bachelor, Bachelor of Arts, Humanities, Cum Laude, major in Comparative Literature, minor in, minor in English, Cognate in Philosophy. Master in Arts in Literature at Ateneo de Manila University at Manila, Philippines, in 1988 as a Robert Southwell Fellow. She also got her Doctor of Philosophy in English Creative Writing at the University of Illinois at Chicago in July 1995, where she was a Fulbright Fellow. The Awards and Achievements of Maria Luisa Igloria The 2014 May Swenson Poetry Prize from the Utah State University Press The 2009 Ernest Sandin Prize in Poetry from the University of Notre Dame Press the 2007 49 Parallel Prize in Poetry from the Bellingham Review, the 2007 James Hurd Poetry Prize selected by the former U.S. poet Lorette Ted Cozer. And to continue the awards and achievements, is there anyone from the class who would like to participate? Yes, Ms. Krishna Nelmida, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Pumam. Good afternoon. Good the 2006 National Writers Union Poetry Prize, selected by Adrian Rich, the 2006 Stephen Dunn Award for Poetry, the first Silva Clare Brown Fellowship, Rockdale Foundation Summer 2006 Residency, finalist for the 2005 George Borgin Memorial Award for Poetry, Poetry Society of America, selected by Joy Harjo, the two, and the 2005 Richard Lemon Poetry Fellowship to the Napa Valley Writers Conference. Next slide, Pa. Uh, since November 20, 2010, Luisa has been writing at least a poem for a day for her daily writing project. And this is these are the books that she wrote. Anyone from the class who wants to read the books written by Maria Luisa Iglaria? Yes, Miss Nalmida again. Cordillera Tales, 1990. Cordillera Tales, New Day 1990, that was awarded 1991 National Book Award at Manila Critics Circle, Philippines. Cartography Anvil 1992 was awarded 1993 National Book Award for Poetry, also at Manila Critics Circle, Philippines. Kurtog, um, and Canta Anvil 1993 that was awarded 1994 National Book Award for Poetry at Manila Critics Circle, Philippines, in the Garden of the Three Islands, Moyer Bell and Asphodel 1995, Blood Sacrifice, University of the Philippines Press, 1997 was awarded 1998 National Book Award for Poetry at the Manila Critics Circle, Philippines. Songs for the Beginning of the Millennium, the La Salle University Press, 1997, that became a finalist, 1998 National Book Award for Poetry at Manila Critics Circle, Philippines. 
Their names, Writing on Women's Transformations, co-edited with Renee Olander, Friends of Women's Studies at Old Dominion University, March 2000, Not Home But Here, Writing from the Filipino Diaspora as Central Editor, and Will 2003, and Trill and Morden, World Tech Editions, Fall 2005, which became a runner-up 2004 editions prize. One Luna's Revolver, which is an Ernest Sandin Prize in Poetry 2009, The Saints of Streets, University of Santo Tomas Publishing House 2013, Night Willow that was published at Financial with Publishing Montreal 2014, and Odd to the Heart, Smaller Than a Pencil Eraser was 2014 May Swenson Prize at Utah State University Press. Next po. Uh, Ms. Nalmida, please continue it to the chapter books written by Igloria. So, chap chap books made by Luisa Aguilar Igloria. Bright as mirrors left in the grass, could so house quarterly spring 2014, check and balance Moira Press and Loco Chops 2017, Howry, Tea and Tattered Pages Press, April 2017, and What is Left of Wings, I Ask, that was 2018 Center for the Books, Art, Poetry Chop Prize at New York 2018. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Next slide po. Did you know, class, that Igloria was an active member of Pintig's Cultural and Education Committee? So what is Pintig? Pintig is a Filipino-American cultural and theater group. She also served as director of the MFA Creative Writing Program, Department of English, from 2009 to 2015, Old Dominion University at Norfolk, Virginia. Next slide, Paul. Uh, is there anyone from the class who wants to read the poem written by Igloria? Please raise your hand. Yes, Miss Robles. The poem is entitled, They Say Filipina is Another Name for Maid by Luisa A. Igloria. In Hong Kong last summer, my office mate and I took turns smiling for pictures in front of the Court of Final Appeal as a joke, or maybe in a kind of atonement because two women boarding the same ferry we took that morning said, in the dialect they were sure we would recognize, is it your day of two? One of them had a quick, nervous way of smiling, as it ready to take it back if we had turned on them with indignation. The other was clearly ready to challenge if the well-intentioned expression of solidarity were read otherwise. It was a day filled with rain clouds, a sky the color of aluminum, the dull sheen on the inside of an old rice cooker. Yes, we smiled. It's our day of two. Is your amo kind? Ventured the younger of the two, shyly. Yes, we said. Thinking of the air-conditioned offices and computers we had left behind for two weeks of R&R &R, as we leaned back on the green railing, the boat punched forward toward the red and yellow buildings, the rickshaws lined up in the shade. Mine too, she said now. But the first one and her voice trailed like a scarf over the water, hesitating. We had to force our way in, said her friend. Picking up the thread, I called the center. You know, the one near the church, migrant. She was this close to being raped. Did you hear about the last one? The one who threw herself off the off hospital roof. Instead of an autopsy, they scraped her insides clean, stuffed her with cotton. Now no one can prove anything. If the body can keep secrets, what can it tell of them? The body as a scroll. What calligraphy, what message did that woman's family unwrap when they received her body aerogram in a bronze, bronze casket? For so many dollars, you can get your name carved in ideographs on an ink stamp that is also called a chop. The shy one asks me to braid her hair. 
She calls me ate, older sister. She shows me the scar on her left leg from shimmying down a mango tree in their old backyard at home. She has just turned 19 and her smile can still be warm as a ripe mango. I run my fingers through the ink of her hair, dividing into three sections. What was loose and rippling in the wind, she has let me gather in my hand. I braid, picking up the faint scent of coconut oil, yeasty, warm, like good bread, rising. She could be my daughter, my niece, my cousin, my best friend. Our new friends take us to the central station where they will share a picnic meal with others. Garlic, pork, and rice, sour broth, rice cakes, meat stewed in blood gravy. They will talk, exchange numbers, letters, news of better openings, the meanings of insults in a foreign language, pictures of grade school children proudly stepping up to receive medals on closing day at school their hands the size of their sleeping quarters. Even on their day off, the army ponders the different ways to share strength in the many lands of the enemy, abroad where they are known by only one name. For the poem analysis, is there anyone from the class who wants to read it for us? Can you raise your hand? Yes, Ms. Robles again. Please read it for us. So the poem does not have syllabic structure and rhyming scheme. So it is a free verse or in Tagalog, we called it Malayang Talud Turan. The poem as a poetic narrative has nothing much that is special about about its sound and structure. It is apparent that the poem has no rhyme and meter. At the same time, the diction is only at a neutral level. It is true that this poem has no rhyme and meter. But always remember, the poem even without rhyme, meter, and sophisticated diction is not at all bland in creativity. Thank you for... Thank you, Ms. Robles. And for, a team, for the theme or moral of the poem, is there anyone who would like to uh, volunteer? Yes, Ms. Arion. Good afternoon. Sir, yun, nakamute ka ata. Take the ball. Team or moral, struggles of OFW. The poem describes the struggles of OFWs working as domestic helpers in Hong Kong. OFWs are abused verbally, physically, and emotionally, and some have died. Despite this, many people wish to work there. Sacrifice for family. These people left their homes and families in order to earn money that they could not even they could not earn their home country. The poem is a message of hope for all these workers workers because despite their suffering, they still manage to sacrifice themselves for their families. They, they regard them as slaves, but the truth is that they only wanted to provide for their families while being mistreated and abused. They put their lives in danger for the sake of their families and country. Hero heroes of the country. They are tr truly the new hero of our country. And we owe a debt of gratitude and respect to all the Filipino who work abroad. This is no shame in the beings of OFWs. As I am proud of those who work there and make such sacrifices for us, they truly are our new country's new heroes for this new generation. Struggles of 
OFWs working as domestic helpers in Hong Kong Zoo. Figurative language. Simile, and her voice strayed like a scarf over the water, hesitating. I braid picking up the faint scent of coconut oil, yeasty, warm like a good bread rising. The body, uh, the body as a scroll. She, she has just turned 19 and her smile can still be warm as a ripe mango. Hyperbole. Their hands the size of their sleeping quarters. Did you hear about the last one? The one who threw herself off the hospital roof. Instead of an autopsy, she scraped her inside clean, stuffed her with cotton. No, no one can provide anything. Symbolism, hero, overseas Filipino workers in Hong Kong. That's all for ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sarion, and thank you for all the students who participated in our little discussion. Let's all first start to discuss the Negros Island Region, or NIR. President Benigno Aquino III signed Executive Order 183 on May 29, 2015, creating the Negros Island Region Ex Executive Order 183, whereas the new region was created by combining Region 6, Western Visayas, and Region 7, Central Visayas to form Negros Occidental and Negros Oriental. Negros is a Philippine island that is part of the Visayas region. The island is the country's fourth largest. The, the Philippine, Philippines Negros Island region has the least number of provinces, only two. It has 19 cities in, to in total, including the highly urbanized city of Bacolod and Dumaguete tying it for the most cities with Calabarzon, which has 19 as well. Negrantes and less commonly Negrosanons are the inhabitants of the island area. The natives used to call Negros Island Buglas, which means to cut off in Filigaynon. Because of the dark-skinned people, the Spaniards named it Negros when they landed in April 1565. Filigaynon, also known as Ilongo, is the primarily language and Roman Catholicism is a predominant religious domination. For the next presenter, may I call on Ms. Jovelle and Del Rosario. Thank you, Ms. Jasmine. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to Ms. Evette and Ms. Mariela. I am here to introduce to you our chosen author of Negros Iron Region, Ian Rosales Casacot. Ian Rosales Casacot was born on the 17th of August 1975, 46 years old. He was born and raised in Dumaguete City, Negros Oriental, Philippines. His parents were Mr. Fermin Bernaldez Casacot and Mrs. Fanny Rosales Casacot. For his educational background, for his educational background, he studied at the International Christian University, Tokyo, Japan in 1998 and the Siliman University, Dumaguete City, Philippines, where he graduated cum laude with a BA in Mass Communication in 1999 and then an MA in English Creative Writing in 2012. He works as writer and professor. His writing fellowship. He was a fellow for fiction at the Siliman University National Writer Workshop in Dumaguete in 2000, the Illegal National Writer Workshop in 2002, and the University of the Philippine National Writers Workshop in Baguio in 2008. Here is the brief history of author's life. Ian Rosales Casaco was, bo was born in 1975 and is, a creative and is a creative writer and journalist living in Dumaguete City, Negros Oriental, Philippines. He is known for his award-winning short stories, old movies, The Hero of the Smart Tango, Rosario and, and the Stories, A Strange Map of Time, the Suligan, the Sugilanon of Etefania's Heartbreak and Things You Don't Know. He ran a critical survey of Philippine literature, an innovative website on Filipino writing and literary criticism. 
Kasakot also does graphic design and teaches literature, creative writing, and film at Suleiman University in Dumaguete City, where he is the founding coordinator of the El Adelberto E. Edith Tiempo Creative Writing Center and where he is a vice president of literature and film of the Culture and Art Council of Suleiman University. For his, for his books and publications, he is the author of six collections of short stories, including old movies and other stories, NCT 8, 2005, Beautiful Accident, University of the Philippine Press, 2011, Heartbreak and Magic, Stories of Fantasy and Horror, Anvil, 2011, First Sight of Snow, and other stories at our books, 2014. Don't Tell Anyone, which is co-authored with Shakira at Andrea Season, Anvil, 2017. And a Bamboo Girls Stories and Poems from a Forgotten Life at Inea de Naga University Press 2018. Where You Are Is Not Here, another short story collection is forthcoming. Beautiful Accident, his collection of stories with Frank LGBT, LGBT themes was nominated for the National Book Award in 2012. Films. Kasakat has directed the short film Trahedi sa Kabila ng Liwanag and produced the documentary City of Literature directed by the Chinese filmmaker Zhao Lewis Liu. Literary works. Apat na pisong buhay, Sleepwalker, Nostalgia by Rene Boy Aviva, God Will Heal, The Broken World, A Song of Peace, Make Us Who Again, Paano Lumaki Ang Kambal, The Seventh Moon by Jeremiah Cardinal, Chapter 24, The Sunrise, An Excerpt, Verus, Nature, Four poems by Patricia Rivera, four poems from Poems for the Dead, Through a Glass, Darkly 1949, The Ghost Manifest or Safeguard, and Focal Social Subconscious, Sugat Mga Sugo, Speculative Fiction in the Filipino Popular Television. And for his achievements, Carla, Carlos Palanca Memorial Awards for Short Story for Children. Carlos Palanca Memorial Award for Short Story. That's all for Ian Rosales Casacot's biography and other information that we gathered. Here is Miss Giselle Superable to start the literary analysis of the story The Last Day of Magic. Miss Giselle, the floor is yours. Thank you, Miss Jovial. Good afternoon, everyone, especially to you, Ma'am Evette and Ma'am Mariela. I am Giselle Superable, and now let's proceed to the literary analysis in one of the works of Ian Rosales Casacot, this story entitled the Last Day of Magic. This story won third prize for short story for children in the 2007 Palanca Awards. And for the summary of this story, it evolved around a boy named Kulas who witnessed the downfall of their land, their world full of magic and spells the get. Magicians alike are getting turned on into reality, which makes their magic not be practiced anymore. They choose to have a much more career-based livelihood like nurses, call center agents, and other corporate works, instead of doing the usual magics that can bring smiles to everyone. Until their city became very pale and very dark, not knowing that Kulas has the only solution, making every magician try again to do their tricks. Kulas appeared in front of them and motivated them to try again. Peacefully and humbly, they tried what Kulas told them and made them feel joy and happiness again. The city became lively again. Kulas just concluded the only reason they become so down is that the citizens of their land turned their backs to what they are before. And the only thing that has been left for Kulas is the hope that he can witness those magics again glowing into their land for their land. The characters of the story, Kulas, Mang Andoy, Maria, Pedrito, Rosario, and Aling Penning. Characteristics Kulas, he is the main character. He made small things fly around him. He is sad because magic faded because of the villagers seeking jobs. His magic wasn't as powerful as others, so he did not feel as if anyone would believe him. He is resilient, believe in magic until the end. Mang Andoy, he is painter that used a magic brush, and he preferred something more useful. Maria, she is a singer and she preferred to be a nurse. Padrito. He played games and used a lucky magic dice and fastball. Also, he preferred to be a call center agent. Rosario. Baker that used a magic strainer. Wanted to be a lawyer. And lastly, Aling Penning. 
She is a writer with magic ink or pen, and she wanted to be an accountant. Accountant. Next is the setting. The story took place in the village of the Get, where a town full of magic. Plot of the story. Exposition. The change came in a crawl of silence and also darkness. No one knew exactly when it began. It must have started the day the sun refused to wake from its blanket of blue waters to the east. Or it must have been the, the night the moon refused to talk to the stars. Or perhaps it was that morning when the cocks did not bother to crow a welcome chorus to the beginning light. Or perhaps that evening when the night breeze took to bed in a deep sleep and nothing stirred all night. Not even the frogs or the crickets that used to lull the village into slumber with their constant music. Or it must have been the moment the light faded away from the cluster of trees the village fireflies dance in. Rising Action When no one had any idea when there was no more magic in the village of the Get, Kulas was the only one who knew. But he was only a child, and the only magic he could do was make things, small things, fly about him. The other people of the Get's community possessed far more magic than he did. With the purity of their melodies, some could still create typhoons. With poetry, some people were able to influence the moon's waxing and wanning faces. Others could communicate with the old woodland spirit, while yet, others could create delicacies, cakes, and pastries made from old and secret recipes that evoke long-forgotten feelings of love even and even hatred. Kulas was sad, knowing that in a town filled with magic, no one would believe a young boy who could only make small objects fly. The, only, the people of the village could have inferred the many things, the many small moments that could be claimed to have sparked magic's unexpected retreat from the get. If they had been just a little more conscious of the slight sniff of the shifting air, but no one knew. There was the lazy sun, the sad moon, the unlit fireflies, and the muted melodies of nocturnal musicians. Perhaps it started with Pedrito. Pula's elder brother, whispering carelessly to a flying wind, I don't believe in magic anymore. The wind whispered it back to the quick silver spread of air in an instant. And when Mang Andoy said, something more useful and more useful than the ordinary magic, Maria stated, I could be a nurse and I don't want to sing anymore. I might work as a call center agent, Pedrito said. I don't want to play any more games. I might be a lawyer. Rosario said, I don't want to bake any sweeter pies. Aling Penning said, I could be an accountant. I don't want to be, I don't want to compose any poems. They said that magic no longer had a place in the get. The fireflies died out one by one with each solemn proclamation until remnant, only remnants of the magic remain. As a result, the magic began to fade. No one in the village was aware of the situation. And for the continuation of the literary analysis, here's the next presenter, Ms. Rose Brendungo. Thank you, Ms. Giselle Separable. And good day, everyone. I'm Rose Brendungo, and this is the climax of the story. Mang and Bella have stopped plucking colors from thin air with this magic brush, but no one in town noticed. The grass had lost its blast of green that day, and the sky had stopped being blue for a moment. Maria's wonderful songs had suddenly turned to silence, and no one had noticed. It was enough to keep the flowers from dreaming too much or the birds from singing from tree to tree on that day. No one noticed that the gator had thrown away his magic dice's lock and his magic ball stood. People began to forget the games they knew and the games that reminded them of their childhood on that very day. When Osario set aside her magical flex trainer, which she used to extract the sweetest juice from fruits enough to crunch the high dust, no one noticed. No one saw Alan Penning's pen had dried out its magical ink casting into a solid block on a piece of discarded paper. There were no more lovers in the get, waking up in the middle of the night with nothing but a passionate need for a kiss. Whereas with 
his simple straw hat and welcome song was the only one you saw that was happening. Whereas on the other hand, the said, everyone in the group soon transformed into something else. Some went, some went on to become doctors, lawyers, engineers, nurses, as the agents, accountants, and among the other professions. Each one immediately became involved in his job by getting that there was a period when everyone had skills that carried the village into the world of wonders. Father Action Harris was the only one who managed to keep his powers. He would go to qualification somewhere in an either alley, not far from the municipio when no one was looking. And then he, he would let his magic sword in the air to touch what remained of everyone's magic. Day after day, he stuck to his always and learned how magic was intimately connected to the soul. He just knew his father, father's own charming chain of fears, which he used to divine the proper path on any journey. The gravity of his talents soon appeared to attract enough all other laws from the law of people's forgotten magic. Resolution Whereas the young boy was the only was the only one who told them. They came into his quiet corner, witness the little king is gravitating in his presence. And the night in the wise box, you may be anything and anything you decide in your life. But it will require our own small magic deep inside ourselves to give us a life of power, energy, and motion of blood. To forget our music is to forget what makes us unique. The last returned everyone's longest magical items. Magic returned to the get in a rush of a, in a rush of a song, dance, and play, as well as color, food, and poetry. And everything went, went smoothly. Above all, he knew how magic might turn any man's life into a happy ending story. Tim. No one thought it could happen. That there finally came a day when there's no more magic in a village at Baguette. And Willis was said, the change came in a curve of silence and also darkness. No one knew exactly when it began. It must have started the day the sun refused the exactly to wake exactly when it began. It must have started the day the sun refused to break from its blanket of of blue waters to the east. Or it must have been the night the moon refused to talk to the stars. Or perhaps it was the it was that morning when the cock did not bother to call a welcome chorus to the beginning light, or perhaps that evening when the night breeze took to bed in a deep sleep and steered all night. Not even the cows or crickets that used to roll the image into slumber with the with the constant music. Or it must have been a moment a bit the light faded away from the cluster of trees the village fireflies dance in. No one knew. Only Kulas knew. But he was only a boy and all he could do for yeah. magic was to make small things fly about him. The other people in the village of the gate had so much more magic than him. Some could steal typhoons with the purity of their songs. Some could Controlled the passing veining of the moon with poetry. Moral of the story. Never forget where you came from in a rem reminder for all of us as we take our journey through life. Before time makes us realize what we had, learn to appreciate what we have. We should embrace our environment growing up. Enjoy it immensely or remember our situation as a kid and be grateful for the good things that allowed it to live. Our past made us who we are today, and if we are happy with who we are, that includes where 
and we grew, we grew up. It's about sharing our gratitudes for the part they played in our, in our lives. Where we came from is inspiration, and it's also our responsibility to pay it for pay it forward and never forget where we came from. Just like Kula said, to forget our magic is to forget that makes us who we are. And that's the moral of the story. And may I call for Justin Manikis, Justin Manikis for sensory imagery of the story. Good day, everyone. Good day, everyone. I am Mary Jasmine B. Manikis. I will be discussing the sensory of imagery and symbolism. For the sensory of imagery, for the sense of sight, the sky was a slate, the earth was parched brown and cracked in places where grass used to grow in their wildest dream. The mountains looked wasted and the air had no cackle of energy. It must have started the day the sun refused to wake from its blanket of blue waters to the east. That very day, the grass lost its shade of green and for a brief moment, the sky stopped being blue. For the sense of smell, if the people of the village were only a bit more aware of the slight sniff of the changing air, they could have divined the many small moments which could be said to have sparked magic unexpected retreat from the get, but no one knew. For the sense of hearing, there was only a quiet, then the direct rockening that called simply for clicking on a confounded device of a strange picture box called a television. The change came in a crawl of silence. No one noticed that Maria had gone mute, her magic song suddenly turning to silence. Not even the frogs or the crickets that used to lull the village into slumber with their constant music. Who last all their brother whispered carelessly to a strange wind, I do not believe in magic any anymore. Stay. There's no sensory imagery for the sense of taste. For the sense of touch, perhaps that evening when the night priest took to bed in a deep sleep and nothing and nothing stirred all night. And for the symbolism, magic brush, an object that is used by Mang Andoy to paint, and it signifies the ability to shape our hidden desires and to provide color to our life. Singing voice of Maria, it represents the giving of wisdom to our life, which keeps the universe humming and balanced. Cloth trainer. It depicts Rosario's tool for extracting the sweetest juice from fruit, and it satisfies our desires while also nourishing our hope. Ball. It is a play that reflects their childhood memories. Dice. Its representation of dice assures that we have limitless set of possibilities can choose from. Pen. It represents the chance for Alan Pinning to write stories, which is their lifeblood and to portray in words what moon could only glow or the flowers could only blossom when, the, when she wrote her poem, Enchanted Game. It represents Kula's father, who is said to be able to determine the best path for every journey. Flying Orbit, Kula's magic that brings back everyone's forgotten magic. Magic, it is a treasure from the past, a gift of ancient Babylon, who were nothing more than shadows of primordial tales and it re reflects the joy and happiness of people in the guest. 